So, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, late morning session on voice and jobs. Very happy to have all of you here. Um, we have a, a great panel that made it to the bank. Very varied backgrounds and we're very much looking forward to hear from from your experience uh, about your thoughts on voice and jobs. Before I introduce you three here and also uh, Benedette who is in the Brussels office whom you will see, I don't know you see already see her on the screen. We're all going to wave now so that she sees us. Please all wave. Excellent. It works. <laughs> Um, before I introduce them, just two introductory remarks from me. Why this topic? Well, of three billion jobs in the world, about half are in non-wage employment. So these are small farmers, uh, not farm employees. They're really small, self-sufficient farmers. These are people in micro-enterprises, the self-employed, a very large number of people who are really not in the labor market, in quotation mark, as we generally think about it. You know, where there's a, an, an employer and you negotiate a, or you don't negotiate a contract and income and working conditions. So, in, especially in the developing world, thinking about these who are really not in the standard type of employment which we have very often in our minds when we talk about voice is very important. Second, of those that are in wage employment, a very large number of them are in informal jobs, small enterprises, informal uh, activities, uh, even informal sector enterprises, which quite some organizations have, have worked on. So many people in the developing world do not have the type of possibilities of being in a voice relationship, in, a, in an organized relationship, uh, as we very often think about it today, the, uni uh, the unionization rate in the developing world is about 10% of all people in jobs, so relatively small. Now, why is voice so important? Well, if you think of it from the self-employed, from the rural farmers, or from the person in an informal enterprise perspective, many of the things that are going against the violation of basic rights, basic human rights, that we don't have exploitative child labor, that we don't have exploitation of the products people sell in markets that are not conducive, where they're actually exploited with the work they do, be it cigarette rolling or BD rolling or be it agricultural production, um, that they have the possibility of collectively working on their environment in which they're working, all that is not there in the form we have it in many of the industrialized countries. So this is why we want to talk about voice and jobs, and we want to focus on other forms of voice, not the ones which are in a much more uh, a kind of formal setting of union relationships. So we have four people uh, on this panel, and I'm going to start with our guest from, from uh, who's in Brussels right now, and I'm very happy to introduce Benedetta uh, Mongeli to you. Uh, Benedetta uh, started a self-health group in Kenya, in one of the poorest slums in Nairobi, in Vivandami. And that uh, self-health group is called Mukurn Talent Development. And the, the idea is, <clears throat> and if you go to the website, it, it says that right there in big letters, we believe that every person has the power to shape their own future. And uh, if you think slums, think wrong. Think different. Do not think about slums in the way we tend to think about them in terms of the, the negative side of slums, but think of it as opportunity. So very much what the organization which Benedetta formed uh, tries to do is to give people hope through building skills. And that's the kind of the classical skills of computer skills, but also dance classes, arts, uh, building their own identity. So, and one of these is also to help them build that identity and in, in, a, in a form that they can voice their opinion both within the slum and outside. So we're very grateful for you to, for you to join us. Thank you so much, Benedetta. Then we have with us Benjamin, Benjamin <laughs> Feifowicz from, from Chile. Uh, Benjamin is a, is a youth leader who 
Uh, I'm not quite sure if you received uh, national fame in the uh, Penguin Revolution, but he was one of, the, one of the leaders of the big student revolution in Chile in 2006, which brought hundreds of thousands of people to the streets. And you, if I understand it correctly, were in the, in the public high school uh, at that moment. <clears throat> A revolution that went uh, and questioned the, the basics of education in, in, in Chile, the education quality, the way the education market worked in Chile, the way universities accepted students. And after that, uh, being propelled into public life, uh, Benjamin started his, his own enterprise, a social enterprise, uh, an NGO, Emprende Joven. And very much the, the idea is that uh, these, uh, the organization has worked with, I think, 35,000 uh, uh, students since 2008 in trying to, again, teach them the skills, but entrepreneurial skills. So um, raise the possibility and everybody to think beyond uh, what, they, what they might come into the program with and, and be innovative, be entrepreneurial, and you focus a lot on cognitive skills uh, and social skills. So we're, we're, we're very grateful that you are here with us for that. Then we have Kathy Feingold from the AFL uh, CIO, fluent in Spanish, I already heard. She, she and Benjamin talked in, um, a little bit in Spanish before. Kathy has uh, worked for a very long time actually in Latin America, and. Um, especially the Dominican Republic and uh, Haiti um, uh, for the Solidarity Center of the AFL-CIO. So on, very, on many things which are very relevant for our debate, um, in, the, in Haiti you actually worked on making the laws accessible uh, for people by um, uh, working on the first Creole language translation of the labor law. Um, you worked on the humanitarian uh, response to the, to the earthquake and before that, before you joined AFL-CIO, I read that you worked for the Ford Foundation and also for UNIFAM uh, very much on that, the, on the voice angle and the empowerment angle um, of, uh, with, with, with many different people. Today, uh, Kathy is the director of the international department of AFL-CIO and is working in the global policy sphere, including with the G20. So very interesting to hear how you link the voice for those who generally do not have voice with these global policy debates. And lastly, and this is also uh, my, my, my first question, we'll go to Renana Ben. Uh, we're extraordinarily happy to have, you, to have you with us here. Renana Ben is the national coordinator of SEVA. Uh, many of you will know SEVA. It's the, the Self-Employed Women's uh, Association uh, in, in India. And Renana Ben has worked with SEVA since 1978. Um, I believe after she finished mathematics degrees and economics degrees in Harvard and Yale, and then joined uh, SEVA, and since then has, a, has an enormous influence and career in that organization of bringing voice to <coughs> self-employed um, women. Working also with the, with the ILO, uh, actually on their uh, conventions on, on home workers, uh, as well as on their uh, treatment and their resolutions on the on the informal sector. Renana Ben um, was the chair of SEVA Bank uh, and very instrumental in building SEVA from a state-based organization to one which is really federal in nature uh, at this stage uh, and a really major political force in India at this time. Renana Ben was awarded the Padma Shri Award, um, which is one of the highest civilian rewards uh, in, uh, in India um, for her contribution in the field of, of social work. So first question goes to you, uh, Renana Ben. Again, thanks so much for being uh, with us. Um, give us a couple of minutes, uh, your story of SEVA. Um, it, it probably less on what the organization is doing today, but how, how it started and how you were able to organize one point, what today is 1.3 million uh, formerly poor or still uh, uh, women who are working in the informal sector. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. And uh, that you've put me a difficult question which wasn't in the notes. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, and uh, since it's on voice, um, you know, <laughs> I, I think what Seva uh, has uh, been able to do is um, 
Our members are women who are in what's called the informal economy. When we first started, uh, that was, as you s said, I've been there. You know, the notes start with a different, mo what is this new model? And I had my answer already, yeah. which was, which was, it's, not, it. it was n it's not new, it's 40 years old. <laughs> so I'm talking about 40 years ago, and in fact, this is our 40th year. And uh, we started as a small subunion of a very big union. Um, and uh, at that time, the belief was that every, all workers would become formal workers and everybody would then have a formal job. And all these workers, you know, who were agriculture workers or street vendors and so on, they would all sort of disappear. And uh, so there was not much point even looking at them. But um, my, the founder of Seva was part of this big union, and she kept finding these women coming to her street vendors who were being beaten by the police, women who were head loaders, carrying loads on their head, um, being paid really, really small amounts. And since she came out of the union movement, she said, you know, they said actually to her that, you know, why don't you represent us? Why doesn't your union represent us? And it couldn't because it was a textile workers uh, union. And uh, so then they all decided to form a new union, a new trade union, uh, which was to be called SEVA. And the reason, actually SEVA is a translation of, um, I'll say it in Gujarati for Swashray Mahila Seva Sangh, which means uh, the women's union uh, of women who work by their own labor uh, and who are uh, who stand on their own labor. And um, it, this, as it emerged, it was just an idea at the time, but as it emerged, uh, it became the voice of all these, at the time, marginal women, marginal workers. And what happened was that one after the other, each of these marginal workers, I call them marginal, they weren't marginal in numbers because 93% of workers are actually in the informal economy in India. But as this union emerged, we realized that it's not just an employer who one has to bargain with. But for street vendors, it was the municipality, it was the municipal laws, and the bargaining uh, for the <coughs> agriculture workers who went from farmer to farmer, it was the farmers. Uh, for home-based workers, it was the big companies like Gap, which were you know, continents away. And so what Seva became was um, an organization, a union which understood the needs of the workers as it was expressed by them, brought it into the larger sphere, and then bargained with whoever they had to bargain with. And just by the way, in 2012, we have 1.7 million. It's gone That's up. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for this. Let me turn to Benedetta. Uh, can you hear us? Good. You might be on mute. There we go, excellent. Um, Benedetta, um, we, uh, I explained a little bit what you're doing, but it would be wonderful to hear from, from, from uh, your own words um, what you think uh, your organization has done in, in bringing really voiceless youth together and what you have seen change for them in the time you've been working with them. Oh, sorry, I think you're on mute. Yes, now it should work. Okay. So uh, uh, when when we formed, I formed MTD. Uh, many I formed MTD after realizing that uh, many young people were dying in the slum because they had joined uh, bad, bad guns. And uh, after the government of Kenya introduced uh, the shoot to kill policy, we lost so many young people from age uh, seventeen to twenty five. So uh, when we formed MTD, there are so many people. I mean, we had some guys who, who are still uh, hanging around with the gangs, in the, in the gangs, but then uh, they came to us and we, uh, we started working together. We started uh, having a peer education with them and uh, uh, talking to them, understanding uh, 
their situations and all that. So after after having all these talks with them, we, we started our different programs like uh, the dance classes and uh, acrobat classes. And then little by little, we introduced uh, different programs that are, are income generating. Uh, like uh, we have a sandal making project and uh, we have a shop that uh, has uh, uh, computers and uh, uh, we offer printing services and these guys uh, work in this shop and also we make uh, some bracelets. So uh, there's a very huge change because uh, these people are focusing now on their life they, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, how they relate also with the police, the police uh, nowadays, they don't see them as uh, potential criminals and they see them as people who can change, uh, which is a, a very huge uh, milestone for us to see uh, young people not uh, uh, having uh, to run away when they see police or uh, not even sometimes uh, uh, visiting the local chief area. Uh, uh, I mean, local chief to go and uh, have a chat, but now it's happening. They are going to the chief. They they have a chat together with the chief and the pol the senior police. Yeah. So that is uh, one of the biggest achievements that we've managed to do to to achieve. And then also right right now they are earning some money. They're not uh, depending on criminal activities to get uh, money. So they are earning as much as they are earning very little. They are happy with that because it's clean money, and they understand the the importance of having this uh, clean money. And uh, they are also working to towards uh, making their lives better. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, let's move yeah. from Kenya in our minds to to Chile. Uh, Benjamin, if I can also ask you something which is not in the script first. Can you, having been a leader in that quite massive revolution um, when you were in high school, um, can you share with us some, some of the beginnings? How, did, how does a wave like that start? Okay, uh, before, uh, before I start, I want to say three things. The okay. first one is uh, thanks for this fantastic introduction that you, that you make me. Uh, I believe that I don't know, I feel like really at home with you guys. And uh, I feel, I don't know, with, with Antonio, with uh, Frederica, I really want to thank you all for, for, for having the chance to be here. And um, the other thing um, that I, I want to say that I'm, I'm having so much fun these days. Uh, I danced with you Gangna style yesterday uh, at the HD American Idol. So, so thank you for this opportunity. Uh, <laughs> Okay, um, all, all this begins uh, with the social discontent. So um, there are mass of people that were unhappy and we were an opportunity or a channel for people to express. Um, the, the students' movement has always been uh, really powerful in our country. And uh, we had a dictatorship 20, 30 years ago that make people to feel really oppressed and make people don't express themselves. So this was uh, like the first opportunity that people had to, to go to the streets and, and say what they feel. And, uh, and it was a whole social movement. It, 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 is, it, doesn't, it wasn't only the people who were unhappy with the, with the, with the schools. People were happy with the social systems, with the health, with, with many things. And we were an opportunity to people to express themselves. So, so that's why uh, we became like, like a really special movement, because there were many things that were oppressed that um, could be liberated with this in 2006. So. Great. And just to follow up question, how did you, so what you, that wave, that enormous movement, how did that shape you personally to then create uh, your, your organization, which tries to bring young people into, to give them voice through building their own identity and skills? Uh, where I, went. I, I was working in, the, in a student's board of the Instituto Nacional, which is the most important public school in Chile, and is the, the, the responsible of, of 
of all this citizens' revolution. Um, I was in charge of public relationship, so I was in charge of the phone. So uh, when the boss told me you have to call the schools to go out to the streets, I pick up the phone say, tomorrow, 8 a.m., uh, go and protest. <laughs> so the phone call was a massive, uh, w had a massive impact, yeah. also the, the, the social network. Yeah. And um, I was the phone man. So yeah. I, I was in charge of the calls. Um, and I could realize that I have this uh, skill for communicate and for motivate. So um, even though this revolution uh, was only for one year, because then it turns off, and, and two years, one year ago, it starts again uh, more more powerfully. Um, I realized that um, I had these skills for moving people. Uh, in this student's board that, that we made, and and, and at this particular year, uh, we made a promise. And the promise was that everyone will go and study different careers and be an expert in different areas. So uh, our boss, our president, uh, studied law in the law school in Chile, and he's an expert in human rights. Uh, we have another one who was an expert, uh, an expertise in philosophy. And uh, what happened is that the, the promise was to join us 10 years uh, after that, uh, that that event and to make uh, another type of a uh, revolution inside our country, but what we have, but what, but what did happen is that um, I, I decided to 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 make my expertise in entrepreneurship, but not seeing the entrepreneurship as making companies. Uh, for me and for the people who I work, the entrepreneurship is a life philosophy. Um, all of you are entrepreneurs. Uh, the entrepreneurship is not having your own business. It's an attitude. It's how you face the different um, aspects of life. So what happened is that I start Emprende Joven four years ago. And what happened is that my friends, my, my friends of the student board, had their own careers now. And then I had the opportunity to hire them. So mm -hmm. now uh, all of us are working in Emprende Joven. And we're working for a, for a better education. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Kathy, uh, in your, your current job, so uh, the AFL CEO Directorship of International Affairs, how, how does the organization itself see these, I, uh, Renana Ben corrected me, it's really not new forms of voice. So it's it, these voice forms for the self-employed, for the rural farmers, and for informal workers. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for organizing this great panel. Um, I would say it's key. It's key to uh, the you know, building power for workers in the United States and globally. And I would start at what wasn't in the intro, uh, sort of an unknown fact, is uh, the way that a global movement or uh, like SEWA can influence the AFL-CIO. Um, so probably, Renana, 14 years ago, um, I was invited to go look at SEWA. And this was when I was still a young staffer. And um, I was invited to go live with um, one of the SEWA workers and representatives. And I was with a delegation of women labor leaders. We were there attending. Uh, it was with WeGo, uh, Women in the Informal Economy, Globalizing and Organizing in SEWA. And so, come back to the United States, and this, you know, you mentioned this is a phenomenon in the developing world, but if you open this morning the New York Times blog, you will see the rise of, you know, contingent work in our country. Uh, most people here don't say informal, the concepts are, are different, but one in four new jobs in the United States is contingent work and below minimum wage. So this is the, I would, I would call it the biggest challenge facing um, uh, workers, organizations, unions worldwide. And the influence that SEWA has had on the AFL-CIO and on the global labor movement at putting this issue front and center has been key. In 2005, uh, the AFL-CIO gave um, SEWA uh, the award for their leadership on this issue. And in 2006, the AFL-CIO passed a resolution um, in support of worker center movements in our country. And for the AFL-CIO, this was a huge step forward. 
So we have this structure that was created to represent workers uh, that was built basically in 1955. And it takes a very long time for us to figure out how do we change this structure? How do we really reflect the reality of what's happening in our economy and the way workers are working today? So in 2006, our executive council issues this resolution that says we are actively going to build partnerships with uh, these worker associations, those that fall out of the very strict definition in the United States of, of labor law protections. So today you can see that the AFL-CIO now includes the New York Taxi Workers Association, uh, Endelon, Day Laborers Organization, Domestic Worker Organization, and we really see this as key to building our movement. Um, they have influenced us as much as I think you know, we work with them strategically. And I would just end by saying that there's also the intersection with uh, migrant rights in our country. And that is really a spark. Most of even the traditional organizing happening in the United States today is really being led by um, migrant workers, immigrant uh, communities. And so that is also key to sort of these intersections, at least in our work, um, between uh, immigrant uh, communities and building worker power. And obviously, comprehensive immigration reform hopefully will cr create even more space for that kind of organizing. Great. Allow me just one follow-up question. In one of the consultations we had for the WDR, where we also work with the ITUC, we actually discussed voice and, and forms of voice. And one of the arguments we did get into with, in Brussels with the, with the ITUC management was um, legitimacy, which is one of the, I, I think, a core concern for many labor union leaders as to what degree informal organizations have representation uh, and the legitimacy to negotiate on behalf of their non-organized workers. To what degree is the, the vision very progressive, I would say, which you have just exposed as the AFL-COO kind of overall policy, to what degree is that shared by um, union leaders within the organization and in the ITUC in general? Great. Just to clarify, the ITUC, for those that don't know, the International Trade Union Confederation is made up of sort of AFL-CIO equivalents from around the world, so national centers. Um, and I would say that it varies very much within the ITUC, and uh, Renata Bank could probably speak of the, the, the many struggles it took to get SEWA into the global labor movement through a global union federation. I think that um, this has been very challenging for the labor movement because, uh, you know, at one, on one hand, um, there is a concern that, uh, especially in some of the debates at the International Labor Organization, that you would just have all these small NGOs and you really wouldn't build real voice and, and build worker power. And I think that has come a long way today. I think that you see now that the reality in the United States, just to give you an example, the reality in the United States is if we want to increase union density in the United States by 1%, we must organize one, a net of 1 million new workers. Now, what that would even cost in the United States with a very broken labor law system is enormous. So I bring it back to your question. I don't think we can be in a situation of sort of focusing on, you know, is a, you know, an NGO is small, big, is what you know. If workers, you know, whether it's taxi workers in New York who say, you know, this is, th th these are our demands and you know, these are the folks representing us, um, then I think that is the, you know, that is legitimate. One way that unions like the AFL-CIO are partnering uh, with informal worker organizations is creating space. And I'll give another example from the recent uh, uh, domestic worker conversation at the International Labor Organization that resulted in a convention. So at the ILO, it's a tripartite body where NGR NGOs cannot formally sit at the table. It's employers, government, and formal trade unions. The AFL-CIO decided, but you need to have actual legitimate voice at the table. And that legitimate voice meant not my voice, I am not a domestic worker. It meant creating space, seeding our, some of our space, and having domestic workers sit at the table with us. And so one of the real challenges I think facing the labor movement is how do you create those spaces? How do you strategically use your alliances? The AFL-CIO has 
some things it can bring to domestic workers um, and to taxi drivers, and they have many things they can bring to us. How do we strategically use those partnerships to, to bring voice to all workers? Great. Just last question for this first block, and then I actually want to bring you in for a couple of questions. But let me just, what you just mentioned, the, the, the struggle Sevoa had of access to the formal labor mo movement. Um, Renata, can you share with us from your point of view a couple of these struggles? Oh. <laughs> just a couple. Yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't that. It's um, I came here uh, uh, wanting to be positive. <laughs> <laughs> no, I um, I, I think I, I I'd like to start. You know, we started with the uh, 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 with the formation of Seva. Um, the labor movement is one major space, or was one major space where the workers had structured voice. So you actually had a forum where you were recognized and you could bargain. Um, and uh, I, I think as Seva, we were very keen that the voice of the workers who were not in the factories and not employer-employer relationships should be brought into that space. Um, I, I, when we first went to register Seva, it was, we were told that you can't be a union because one, uh, there's no employer-employee relationship, so who are you going to bargain with? Two, you're all women, so you know it's discriminatory. Um, and three, there are so many different trades and you should have one trade. And this was back in 72, but we have been registering unions still and we still come across the same argument. So the recognition of informal workers as workers and therefore as able to get into these spaces is always has been a problem and still is a problem uh, regarding the ituc you know we what we believe is that since capital has globalized therefore workers should also globalize and informal workers even more and so we have always tried to be part of the international movement and have been part of the, um, <coughs> the uh, global federations. Um, and also very closely linked with, uh, like Kathy saying, with the AFL-CIO. So one of the things we said was that we would also like to be part of the International Trade Union Congress, the ITUC, which was then the ICFTU. Um, the opposition to organizations and unions like ours comes from the think from very powerful trade unions who th who say that if you let the informal work well there are a number of arguments which uh, one is if you let the informal workers in then you will recognize informal work and therefore will negate the years and years of struggle to um, get labor laws and so on. So it's better you completely get rid of the informal workers. But of course, you know, that's not really an option. Everybody would love that if you could become, mm. everybody becomes formal, but it's not an option. But there are very ideological ideas that no, you cannot recognize informal work. So that was one major opposition we faced. And the second major thing is that these, that SEVA is not a union because it doesn't bargain. But we had to prove that we do bargain. We, don't we do bargain with employers also, like um, we bargain with um, employers who give work to women who are be uh, cigarette rollers, or we bargain with, uh, with farmers who give work to agriculture workers. But our major bargaining is in other areas. For street vendors, we have to bargain with the municipality. So I think what we were saying and what was finally recognized is that you do bargain, but you bargain in other forums. And finally, the issue came up that you're all women and you're discriminatory. And we said, yes, we were. <laughs> so, so those were the kind of uh, issues that kept coming up. And it came up in many forums. And you know we had to answer it in many forums. But I think the main reason we got in was because of the friendships that we were able to build up uh, with mm -hmm. more stronger unions like the AFL-CIO, uh, the Dutch unions, um, and, st and some of the other unions which did support us. So we are now a member of the ITUC.
Thank you. Thank you so much. I do want to bring you all in so we heard the kind of very practical experiences from uh, our youth leaders. And we had a debate about at the really global level um, about how the, the international trade union uh, uh, positions itself and also has gone through a change process of bringing organizations like SEVA in. Um, the, the next block, we'll, we'll talk very much about policy. What is the link to policy, both for, especially from the, and I want to hear from the youth leaders as to your influence there, but let's open it up. I should warn you that this session is live streamed. So everything you are saying, millions of people could see. I'm not quite sure how many are actually linked in, but everything is recorded and it'll be all on YouTube. So choose your words carefully. A um, couple of questions from you, please. Nancy, do you, did you want to come in? No. Oh, I thought you, you that was it. Uh, we'll start with Nancy uh, from the office here at the Iowa. Hello, um, I'm Nancy Donaldson, the director of the ILO office in Washington. Um, actually, I just wanted to, to say I found myself thinking um, as the colleagues were talking about the Middle East in particular and, and what um, we've learned from our regional um, teams um, in working with the rise of voice in different Middle Eastern countries and North Africa. And one of the things um, that I felt that you were bringing out in this discussion, which I also want to say, is the ILO as a UN agency really are, um, had to say, we need to step back and we need to hear from those, the voice of those independent unions in Egypt who were not uh, able to be registered for years. And maybe their voice won't come in the organized way that we're used to. Maybe the issues on the table from their perspective, the, the threshold issues are not going to be the typical threshold issues. And so we as an institution, and we as a voice for labor in the multilateral context, we have to learn from them on how things will go. And perhaps we'll be able to share some of our knowledge as well, but we can't start in, a, in the same place. And I think that has continued to be true for year, all these years so far. Thank you so much. Um, please, uh, come, could you please step up and use one of the mics on the table or the mic there, exactly. Thank you so much. Um, so questions to the, to the panelists, please. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the knowledge and experience shared. I'm Ragda from Egypt office. Uh, I have a question specifically to Benjamin, uh, specifically because you're a young uh, man from Chile. And uh, now in Egypt, it has been actually since revolution until now, there are lots of students uh, demonstrating and having moves and strikes uh, for education, whether for the quality of education they have been taught or for the quality of schools they go to. Some uh, demonstrations are against the fees, increasing fees. And you have also demonstrations of teachers against the quality of education as well as their career development. Uh, I'm sad to say that nothing has actually been achieved apart from all these demonstrations happening one after another, but not, none of these demands have been really achieved. So I'd like to hear from your experience. What is your advice? How you think this work can be organized in a better way so the demands can be achieved, the voices can be heard equally as happened in your country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please, in the back, we'll collect a couple and then we'll come back to the panel. Hi, good morning. My name is Matt Morton and I'm uh, with the World Bank and the Gender and Development Team. I really appreciate your presentations. When I was a teenager, I was part of a national youth council here in the United States for runaway and homeless youth. And I learned a tough lesson. We in, had a big national conference and we invited uh, homeless youth to apply to tell their stories in front of others. We wanted them to have voice in front of a, a national audience. One of those youth had a very compelling story. He experienced lots of trauma. He came, he gave a speech. Uh, and uh, he broke down crying, and the whole event was very difficult, very traumatic for him. And I, it probably did him more harm than good. So it taught me something really important about voice, that it requires more than opportunity, but also support so that uh, young people or participants or women or people in uh, circumstances of vulnerability can take a, advantage of those opportunities in meaningful ways. So my question is, uh, what kinds of supports or processes 
do you provide for the most vulnerable people in your constituency so that they can express their voice well? Thank you so much. Um, Ijaz, please. The question, I, my, my name is Ijaz Ghani, Economic Policy Prem Unit. The question for the panel is, it seems, looking at the data that voice and jobs have a strong gender component. When we examine male and female participation in the informal sector over a large group of developing countries, we find that men have successfully managed to move out from informal to formal sectors. Their share has declined. The participation of women in the informal sector has increased dramatically, which has really made the informal sector persistent. The question is, just creating space for informal sector and trade union may not be enough. The way cities are built, you know, which helps or hinders women's mobility, the kind of human development skills they get, all of these matters. So, so really, this question is for the next session. You know, what kind of policies will help for women to make the transition from informal to formal sectors? Great. Thank you so much. And that's, I think, a nice uh, lead-in for the next question. Or maybe we have one more, but that's the last for this round. Uh, uh, we'll come you. back then to the to the next round of questions. If you thank you, Yesko. Uh, my name is Eugenia Marinova. I'm currently not working on AHD, but uh, I just wanted to share also some experience, especially regarding vulnerable people and voice. When I were work was working in Africa, I was involved with a project which uh, was run in a maximum security prison in the Western Cape in South Africa. And uh, this was a project in which uh, inmates uh, had started supporting HIV orphans through making clothes for them and toys for them. And uh, then some of this started as a you know support for the kids, but at this point in time, the project is still running and they're making jewelry that is sold uh, worldwide. Uh, so my question to the panel was, how are such very informal groups uh, without a voice being captured? Are they captured? Is there any way in which such initiatives can be further supported? By the way, the way I got involved in this was in organizing a development marketplace at which this project won support from the bank. And I'm proud to say that it's still running. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eugenia. So let us turn back to the, to, the, to the panel, and what I'd like to do is combine some of the questions which we've heard with, with giving the, the floor uh, to, to our panelists also on kind of the next broader topic, which is um, <coughs> how, how, how do you influence policy, uh, what, what it just uh, had already mentioned. But really start with our, with our youth leaders, and maybe we can start with, uh, with, uh, with Benedetta uh, uh, first. Um, you heard uh, the comments here from, from uh, our Egyptian colleague, uh, also the, the experience uh, of, of that voice is a double-edged double sword, that actually giving voice can also uh, mean putting people into situations which are very difficult to deal with, and how the support uh, in uh, gaining voice actually works. Can you share uh, wh what how you think about this, um, how the, the activities you do in, in the slums of Kenya uh, prepare people for it actually assuming that voice. But then also, uh, uh, what are some of the success stories, what you see in the, in the youth groups with whom you've worked? What have they done? Is there some stories which you feel are very telling in that respect? OK, thank you very much. Um, in regard to... Um, uh, youth's uh, voice being heard. Okay, uh, for us in the in the slum, uh, before we had all these problems uh, that uh, uh, we wanted to be heard by the local uh, local area chief, because uh, some of the uh, policies that they came with, uh, they they only went to the to the old people, and uh, also uh, there was uh, some. Uh, a job that was introduced in Kenya, it was called uh, Kazi Kovijana, which means a uh, job to the youth, but uh, somehow it went to the older people. And because uh, 
uh, one thing uh, youths with us young people we we are very rebellious and sometimes when we ask for things we can be very pushy and uh, uh, once we are very pushy sometimes it becomes uh, the elders don't even want to listen to us because they see us as violent people but uh, one of the most successful things that uh, we've managed to do is uh, sitting down with these people and uh, having a conversation and uh, respecting them, making them understand that we are their children and uh, they have to listen to us. If, uh, if, if they don't listen to us, then that's why they have, uh, uh, they have criminals coming up in the slum. So after having, uh, making a good uh, relationship first with the, with the leaders, uh, as much as we know they are corrupt, but just making them realize that we, we are not rebellious, we want to, to work together, uh, things have really changed. And uh, right now, uh, we, anytime we want something from the chief or the, uh, the, the area administration, normally we go to them and uh, uh, as much as we know sometimes they might ask for money, we try to, to be good uh, which is, I mean, sometimes it's not a good thing, but uh, it lead, leaves us with uh, no, no choice. Because if we become rebellious or we become very pushy to them, uh, they're not going to listen to us and we'll never have a chance to talk to them. So we've tried to be very professional in the way we deal with, uh, with these issues. Uh, sitting down and having dialogue and trying to listen to each other and then uh, we come to a conclusion together as uh, as mature people. So that is uh, one of the ways that we've managed to go get through, uh, I mean to get our voice being being heard by the administration in our area. And uh, also we've had um, uh, we've, we've also uh, recognized the administration. Sometimes when we, we have uh, um, maybe we want to have an event, an open event in the slum, an educational event through our performances. Uh, normally we invite them to come and see what we are doing so that uh, they have an idea of what we are doing. We're not just uh, wasting time and uh, uh, they see we are also working towards the best, of, uh, uh, best interest of the slum. So yeah, that's what uh, I, I don't know. I, it, I think it it's uh, because Egypt is one big uh, country and it might be uh, maybe people have a different way of looking at it. But then I believe I strongly believe in dialogue and I believe uh, uh, being uh, violent or going to the to to the uh, to the streets. Sometimes it does help, but uh, not always. It doesn't work always. So. Maybe this time, because it has not worked, uh, they should look for an alternative, like try to sit down and have a dialogue uh, with the leaders and uh, see how it's going to work. Thank you. And, and what you described is, is, is very much that, that entry level of, of having space really at the local level, that you have your, you know, the, 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 the youth group you're working with, trying to build them a future and an identity away from crime and violence, which you describe. Can I ask, who, who yeah. do you see as your allies? Whom do you work with? Which organizations do you turn to for support? For example, the, the, the labor movement in, in Kenya, would they be a, a partner for you to, to talk to? Uh, we haven't uh, talked to uh, big organizations. The only organizations that we've worked with uh, we've worked with uh, is uh, there is a one big organization called uh, Go Down. It's uh, an organization for artists. So sometimes we take, we, we we ask for their advices. But uh, in terms of uh, the labor uh, labor organizations, we haven't talked to any uh, because initially our aim was to to look at a way we can uh, get these youths busy. Uh, and then uh, that is uh, one of our future um, plans. We will partner with a big organization like uh, uh, maybe the labor organizations. But for now, because uh, we don't even, the many youths in the slum don't even have that job to go and claim their rights in that, in the job. So we are, 
we are concentrating in making them understand the importance of having the job and not uh, turning to criminal activities. So, yeah, but that's a future. We we are, we are, that is a future plan. We 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 look at that in future. Great, thank you, thank you so much, Benjamin. To you that. Uh, uh, um, in Joven, maybe you actually want to give us a, a little bit of background, just what you are, what you are, what you're doing, and that uh, how you see um, that not only building the, the these young people up to have a different future, but uh, how are there success stories on your side where you see not only them becoming entrepreneurs, but also uh, helping uh, shape their own future by being becoming active by going to the policy space. Um, by talking about the things which are really on their on their minds. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, um, so in in Emprende Joven, what what we what we do um, is that we um, we develop a methodology that's called Learn by Failing, uh, which it consists in um, games and dynamics that are, uh, that, are, that challenge the students and develop develop non cognitive skills. Uh, non-cognitive skills, as James Heckman see, uh, see the non-cognitive skills, such, a, such as the self-confidence, the discipline, uh, the persistence. Okay, so uh, we took two really important research. One of them is uh, David McLellan. Uh, he took uh, 500 entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, uh, spiritual entrepreneurs, um, um, business entrepreneurs, and uh, the outcome of, the, of this research was that for being an entrepreneur, you have to develop 30, 30 skills. Uh, 20 of them are long-term development skills, and 10 of them are short-term. So what we do uh, is that with this learn by failing methodology, we develop these short-term skills, such as the self-confidence, uh, uh, the persistence, um, defining goals. And on the other hand, we have another research of James Heckman, um, who took the cognitive skills and the non-cognitive skills, and he correlates them with the liberal market. And the outcome was that the non-cognitive the non-cognitive skills uh, are such as important as the cognitive skills. So me as an employee, I want someone to to be I don't know, to arrive at time. Um, we work in the mining in the mining areas. So if you are going to uh, give someone a machinery of five million dollars. You don't want him to arrive drunk at, at work, right? Um, so what we do is that we develop this methodology and we reform curriculums inside the schools. Um, so we insert this ch subject, which is mandatory, and it's called entrepreneurship, but is uh, on a subject of developing skills for life and labor. So that 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 is what what we're doing in, in Chile, and. Um, if the school uh, doesn't want to reform their curriculum, we train teachers. And for example, um, if the teacher is of, is of math, we train them on creativity, on empathy, so he could create and he could develop their own games for his subject. So we have a network of more than 50 teachers that has uh, tablets, that has an, an Emprende Joven app, which you can download it on the App Store. Uh, and um, they are creating methodology and sharing methodology through all the country. Uh, we also make classes in universities and we teach to the students who want to become teachers this methodology and the final test is to create methodology. So we packed all the things that uh, the experts make that are the teachers and uh, we share it with all the teachers that have our app. With our app. So we truly believe that the teachers are not the problem. We believe that methodology is the problem. And um, what we are doing in our country is reforming the schools because that, that's our assumption. And uh, well, the impact, uh, we have, we have been, re been really serious about uh, how to measure. And it is really difficult how to measure skills, right? Uh, many of you may have some, you know, being the computer, uh, weeks, months, or years to see how can we measure skills. And we have been working in uh, different types of skills measurement. Okay, um, in, in 2008, we make uh, an experiment with control groups uh, inside the schools, and uh, we develop and we correlate them four years 
after the intervention. And right now, the kids that pass through our methodology uh, earn 8% more salary than, than the other ones that do not pass through this methodology. And the 17% of the people who pass through our methodology is related or was related in some, some way with entrepreneurship. Um, and the other group was 8%. Um, so we've been reforming all the technical schools in Puerto Montt. Right now, we're reforming all the Bicentenario School, which is, are the government excellence schools. And this year, we have a lot of projects, a lot to do in Coquimbo, we will, uh, in the north of Chile, and um, in the mining areas. So uh, it, it, it is a really fun job. So if you want to join us, mm -hmm. uh, it would be really great. Thank you, and, and I, I think there's a lot of apps and Twitters, and uh, you already Twittered your, your friends, I saw yes. uh, earlier that they all follow you. Um, is, one of your, is one of your goals also to have, to, to not only have some result on the income side, but also have people, young leaders who shape Chile, to, who provide voice to others? Um, and if so, how do you do that? Uh, what we believe is that uh, we have a really famous football player in Chile that's called Alexis Sanchez. I don't know if, if you know him. Is like he plays in, in the Barcelona right now. Um, and what happened with him is that uh, it's someone from Real Madrid. No? Okay. Uh, uh, what happened? <laughs> uh, what happened is that we believe that there are too many Alexis Sanchez inside the schools right now. Alexis Sanchez in the social environments, in the political environment, in the academic environments. But they get lost. They get lost because in our country, th they're not, mm, they're not, there are too many asymmetry of information. Um, people do not believe that they can make things, that can make things happen. And the main skill that we develop is the self-esteem. If people do not believe in their dreams, uh, they, they will not make things happen, right? And we train teachers because we believe in teachers. Uh, I believe personally in all teachers. Uh, I believe that methodology is wrong, not the teachers. And um, what we do is that we transfer this methodology that we can make a bad teacher a motivational teacher. Uh, because today there are too many resources in internet. You can put a video that could motivate uh, your students and then reflect on it. There are too many ways of making classes. And what we're pursuing is to take all this Alexis Sanchez, all this Messi, right? Uh, or that are in the schools that can't grow up uh, because our country had too many chances to, you know, to develop things, to create things. Uh, our country is amazing. It's amazing. And I know that uh, these people could you know, achieve their dreams. Uh, what, 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 what we're trying to do is to develop the skills for them to achieve their dreams. Uh, and that's the way of being an entrepreneur of a life philosophy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. So let's move from the municipal policy sphere, which we had here, to your idea of inspiring that self-confidence for people to go out and make their voices heard um, to, um, to Seva. Where do you see the, the next policy? What, what, are, what are on your policy agenda? Both going a little bit into the direction of, of Edger's question, um, municipal policies in, in general, land, land uh, policies, which are so important for female labor force participation, but then also at the global level. We started talking about the ITUC. What's next? Um, just a little bit of uh, some of the issues that came up uh, when people were speaking and um, going from voice to policy. I think, you know, voice can be used in any way. Um, uh, when you open your television, there are voices, and you listen to the radio, and there are voices. What do we mean by voice? I think we don't, me what we mean by voice is really um, a recognition of an issue, or of people who have not been recognized before. Um, and but it does can't stop there. You can recognize that there are all these exploited people. There are all these women working in their homes, and they are not even seen. But so what? 
And so the next point of voice is also representation. You can't just say this is my problem, but you have to be able to bring it to a forum, to a place where things are able to change. And that's where the policy uh, point comes in. Uh, I, you know, going to Ijaz Ghani's point, um, it, it's actually true that when um, opportunities are created and when incomes go up, men move in and women move out. So women are always moving into the lower opportunity. I'm sorry to say this, but especially not, not necessarily for very highly skilled women or highly educated, but for the majority, women tend to move into the lower income, less secure work. Um, Policy-wise, I'm not really happy with this informal-formal divide. When we say informal work, we're really talking about unprotected, insecure, low-income work. And uh, it just so happens that the bigger uh, formal companies are giving uh, more secure and better-paying jobs. But... Um, I think the answer, and this is the policy issue that you're talking about, is <coughs> how do you make informal work more secure, higher paying, and um, a more access to uh, social security? And um, I, 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 you know, it's not a simple answer. Uh, first, it really varies from sector to sector. Um, you talked about municipal laws. Right now, with rapid urbanization, rapid um, infra infrastructure coming into urban areas, uh, what we are seeing is that the municipal laws and the municipal policies are sort of pushing out uh, street vendors, waste collectors, um, trans different small transport workers, small self-employed. So I think the issue there is what are the policies that we need to preserve and protect and enhance their employment? For example, um, right now in India, we are working on a street vendors law, a law which recognizes that street vending is a livelihood that is, uh, helps the urban poor. And it is a space issue. Um, so the city must give enough space for that number of street vendors. So that's a particular policy. But I think on the larger scale, uh, OK, and just to add to that is the social security policies. Because social security, which is health care, old age care, child care, how you, we need social security which applies to everybody, a sort of floor of social security. So I think these are the policies that will change uh, the conditions of the informal sector, whether it will put them all into formal sector jobs, I don't know and I don't think it will. At the international level, I think that also needs to be recognized. And that's why you know, we're um, part of creating this international network called WIGO, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, to recognize that we're not going to suddenly you know, create uh, formal sector jobs for everybody. What we're going to be able to do is b have better social security, have more secure um, employment, so that by changing policies. And I think this is what, uh, at the international level, we are trying to get recognized. Thank you so much. So let me take that statement, what you, what you just gave, um, and, and, and uh, ask Kathy. So we heard, just heard from Renana Ben uh, that the policy agenda needs to be to make informal work better, more productive, and secure. Whether that is linked to formalization or not is, is almost secondary. Um, it, it, what's your reaction to that? And how would you, from the AFL-CIO, take that type of dialogue into the G20 round of discussions? Well, I think very much that we would um, agree that, you know, I think for so long everyone was sort of obsessed with formalizing. And I think uh, we would agree that one of our key policy agenda items at the G20 and for the global labor movement is support for what we call so social protection floor, um, which we think is, is key for all workers. I mean, you can see it getting eroded. Actually, the current crisis uh, right now has given many governments an excuse to begin to erode it. You, you know, at a time when we have an analysis of, um, you know, the, that the current sort of uh, economic policies that had been pushed 
uh, on countries actually have led us to some part to this current crisis. We're seeing governments taking sort of advantage of this crisis to kind of roll back worker rights um, and roll back many of these social protections. So in terms of a policy agenda, one of ours is absolutely trying to push back on the fact that right now, I mean, throughout Europe, you are just watching you know, undoing of collective bargaining and you don't have to go to Europe. You can be right here in the United States. You can go to Ohio. You can go to Indiana or Michigan, Wisconsin, um, right to work laws. So there is definitely an attempt during this moment of what's seen as what we, we call a jobs crisis. It was a financial crisis, but I think we all would agree, and given your report, there is a serious jobs crisis, and given current growth projections, it doesn't look like it's gonna be solved. So absolutely, I don't think we wanna focus on, you know, is it informal or formal? It's making uh, sure that we have that social protection floor. In terms of global policy fora, um, it's, it's been, I, I follow the G20 for the labor movement and some people might know that we have something called the L20. So within the G20 there's the labor 20 and there's the business 20. And what has been astonishing is if you looked at the agenda of the G20 during the crisis, jobs was not on there. Um, and so unfortunately we've had to spend a lot of time pushing a social protection floor and jobs within the global discussion of how to address the current crisis. Right now, if you look at a lot of the uh, documents that come out of the G20 and currently in the uh, Russia um, leading the G this G20 round, the documents look good, but the implementation of what's in those documents, like there's issues around gender equality that's included in the documents, but we have a huge implementation gap. So some good rhetoric, um, better rhetoric, uh, still a lot of gaps. And um, we are seeing now more than ever, I think, a really challenging time for workers across all different kinds of sectors um, because there's growing attacks on worker rights and rollback of social protections. Well, thank, thank you so much. I think we've covered a lot also on this policy uh, side from really the individual and local level uh, moving up to thinking through municipalities and then ending up at the global. I do want to throw it open again. Um, we have about 15 minutes. Questions for the panel, which they answer, but also short, so please limit yourself, reflections of what does this mean actually for us from, from the bank? We traditionally have not worked on voice much. We have um, not worked uh, uh, very often with labor unions, in some country cases, yes, in others not. But what does this mean for the work we do also as a network, as HD? Let's start here. And introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Yesko. I'm Kaiser Khan, HD sector leader, currently in West Africa, moving to East Africa. And I'm working on a set of democracies now and moving to a more authoritarian base. And that's the broader aim of the question. You made a very convincing case for the importance of voice for empowerment and improving people's conditions. But when you move from a democratic, um, I live in uh, Accra, Ghana now, it's a democratic system and things move along. It does work. I'm moving to Addis Ababa, where the government is less willing to let, let voice flourish. Not that the government is not interested in development. They're more worried about it. And there are many countries like that. And, and how do we deal with these issues in countries which are, in all the examples, you know, in India or Chile are, and in Kenya are democracies. I mean, how do you deal with these examples in countries which are more authoritarian, less likely to let this flourish? Thank you so much. Your neighbor, please. Thank you. My name is Claude Sekabaga. I'm a specialist in based in Nairobi. My, my question is related to the dilemma we have. For those small businesses, we call informal, this is for me it's not issue, as she said. But how to, to have the right access to social security, maybe a minimum of a salary payment, and make a, 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 a voice in, in manner you not disincentivize people who want to invest in those, develop those businesses. Because if you see in developing countries, if you take some countries, domestic workers represent maybe 90% of, of job in the country. Then if you increase the, the in terms of voice to have minimum salary, access to, 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 to social security, maybe the cost to the employer we be beyond his capacity to, uh, to, 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 to give a job and you reduce also the number of jobs. I think we have some dilemma we need to manage. I don't maybe ILOs can advise based on different 
experiences. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Floor is open, Samantha. Thank you. Um, I work in Afghanistan, and I mean, voice is not um, an issue I have thought about much, but um, one of the success factors in, in um, education has been when communities actually stood up to the Taliban and kept their schools open. Um, and I'm just thinking that getting the girls to, to actually form a voice uh, might be a very useful thing, both in terms of um, negotiating with government, but also perhaps, perhaps even with insurgents. And I'm, you know, the bank can't go out and organize the girls to sort of speak. I mean, you hear of Malala in, in, in Pakistan. We don't have something like that in Afghanistan. But I, I'm just wondering how, how, what do you think about that, but how we can also sort of promote it a bit more. Thank you. Other questions, please? Yes. Results? Results? Uh, yeah, results. there has to be some results to what we're saying. No, really, I, I am I'm Mahmoud from Egypt, and I would like to continue with what Raghda said and with what Kaiser Khan said, um, and ask Benjamin again, sorry, Benjamin, but uh, we, really, we really need to learn, because uh, in Egypt and other Middle Eastern countries, it's not easy to get your voice. Now in the streets, we have Egyptians go in all the streets, and we have voice. But we, when you don't have a ruler or a ruling party that is responding to that, for example, you don't have uh, secret police in, in Chile. You, you don't have this. So you, you, when, you, when you want to talk and, and, and you, you have your voice and you, you make your own organization and you get people in the street, you're not arrested? This is my question. And that may answer part of what uh, Raghda said. Thank you. Good. I, I, was, I was breathing. We're definitely getting into a substantive debate about social and political change here. Other questions, please? No, then why don't we uh, why don't we turn it back? I mean, we heard uh, quite some questions on on grassroots organization, but also on how to how to organize and how to provide voice in in uh, authoritarian regimes. Um, the, uh, Benjamin, why don't we start with you? The question was directly to you. Now, 1996 was not 1986 in Chile, um, but tell us about your take on that. Um, well, I will talk about my. Can you hear this? Yeah, about my, my own experience. Uh, I want to tell you a little story. Um, remember that, that I told you that uh, my student board, we made a promise and we will you know, specialize in different areas and uh, in 10 more years we will join and, and change our country and the world. You remember that, that I told you that? Well, that was in jail. <laughs> um, uh, th we, we went to protest and um, we get arrested and um, me, my boss, and the people who is working with me and who are watching right now online, uh, they, may, they may be laughing right now because, um, uh, yes, we, we, we were arrested. Uh, and the, op the oppression in, in our country during the protest is like really hard. And you, you can see videos and uh, you can see videos in YouTube or, uh, or for pictures in the newspaper. Uh, the recent one was like a really strong um, from the police, right? Um, many people, the, the police officers, you know, hitting girls, uh, students, uh, people from university. It was a really, really, really hard, um, you know, episode in, 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 in our country. Um, about, about our student board, um, I, d I don't think there's a formula because um, it, it varies um, by, by the culture. Uh, in in 2005, 2006, uh, we fail. We fail and uh, we cry, and we cry one year, two years, and uh, we start asking why, why we fail. And what happened is that last year, uh, the revolution was about learn by failing, uh, the methodology that we're uh, using in the schools. So through the failures, through, through the knowledge that they took in the, in the past experience, uh, now they have more tools to um, negotiate with, uh, with the government because they say, okay, but look what happened five years ago. So um, I think that it is really important to capture uh, cases, uh, similar cases. Uh, we have one in, 
in la last year in Chile, and uh, to examine the details of those cases to, I don't know, to improve and to articulate what's happening in Egypt. Uh, I, I, really f I really think that, that uh, the voice should be unified, to be stronger. Um, and, and starting debates about uh, unify the voices, I think it's a really good beginning for uh, have a really good negotiation. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Benedetta, over, over to you with a little bit the same question. And I do think one, one thing we're, we're kind of coming towards is, is, is voice and aspiration. Uh, we talked about Chile. We're talking about the, the, the Middle East. If you think about um, your work in, 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 in the slum, Obviously, by giving that voice, you also raise expectation, which is also one of the comments we heard earlier uh, here in, in, in Washington. Um, you gave us a story about when you worked with the municipal authority that you set down. W what happened if that fails? How do you deal with aspiration of the people you work with? Uh, okay. Uh, when... When we've been, I mean, have, when after having all this discussion with uh, with our local leaders, um, most of the times that uh, they listen to us uh, because we try to use the uh, the pol like the system of them looking at us as the parents, but that's not uh, that that does not mean that uh, when we look we go to a higher level they listen to us. Uh, we've had a. Uh, at some point that we go maybe to a PC, like provincial commissioner, but uh, we are not even allowed to get into the, uh, to the gate. So it's also a very big challenge uh, for us because at the local level we manage to get to go through, but the higher you go, the difficulty it becomes. Uh, so uh, one of the other ways that uh, we, we, we try to get our voice being heard is uh, uh, when we have a big, we, we normally organize uh, events uh, every year, at least we have a few community events. And uh, many are the times that we invite press to come and uh, uh, film what we are doing. And uh, if we get uh, press to show somewhere in the news what we are doing, then uh, uh, sometimes in future, when we, we 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 go back to somebody who saw us in the in the uh, in the television, then that makes a difference. They they listen to us because they saw us uh, in the television. So I can give an, a good example. Like uh, in 2009, we organized a very big event. It was called uh, Miss Vuandani, uh, and this Miss Vuandani was uh, filmed by two uh, local televisions. And uh, uh, it was aired in the middle of uh, a big uh, TV show, and everyone knew about it. So this may gave me a lot of publicity uh, to uh, to some leaders. And uh, I remember uh, going like uh, to two offices uh, to talk to the DC, and the DC listened to me because uh, he remembered having seen me somewhere in the television. So also media is one of the biggest, uh, I mean, is one of the important thing that I think can give us a voice. Uh, if uh, maybe uh, if the local leaders don't uh, agree, I mean, do, don't listen to us. Sometimes we end up to turning to the media because um, media is, uh, uh, it has a very big influence also to the people and uh, uh, to the politicians. That's how I look at it. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. That actually leads yeah. then to, to maybe Renana Ben to give us her uh, her reflections. We only have a couple of minutes left. But how, for example, how has Seva used, we just heard the media at, in the beginning to to give voice and actually to, to allow also the space in an, probably in many states, environment which was more about clamping down rights rather than allowing them? Um, 
actually, I wanted to take this discussion a little further, and I'll bring in the media. I, you know, the uh, authoritarian regime issue, and uh, <coughs> you know, how how does voice represent itself when um, when there is no democracy or when the political system is not democratic? Uh, I, I first, <laughs> I wanted to say that you know what we're talking about voice is just a way. Uh, it's a means for change, for going towards a better society. So uh, if we're, we're talking about building up a society which, uh, I mean, the people who participate in this are people who care about equality and justice and better cooperation. And it's a long process. And what we have found from our experience is the type of voice, the type of tactics or strategy, it has to depend on the local situation. You uh, cannot have a uniform, you cannot always, you know, sometimes a rally coming out on the streets, it, it is very effective, and sometimes it is not effective at all. Uh, I, somebody raised about working in Afghanistan, we also work in Afghanistan. And uh, <clears throat> apart from not having a democratic system, um, the women who are part of our membership, they cannot even go out in the street. And that is also true not only in Afghanistan, but also in parts of India. So you know, we may have a very democratic political system, but the so society is such that she is not allowed to go out of her house. And if she does, she may very well get assaulted. So the thing is that uh, it doesn't only depend on the democratic system. It also depends on what the local situation is and how people can build up, to be built up, to be less afraid, to be more cooperative, and to be more sympathetic uh, to what is happening. So uh, it's, uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's a very general answer, but my point, I think, here is that you have to just keep on going on with it. That you have to believe that things, that people do have the courage and do have the potential and keep on trying to organize so that they are able to develop that potential. Thank you so much, which is very much echoes what we heard from Benedetta. The, the, it, is, it is a struggle and you need to believe in that struggle leading to a positive end. Your final comment, Kathy, on to what degree is uh, in the G20 is voice and actually working in environments that are repressive a topic? Thank you. Um, I mean, I would start, I, I think, uh, going back to your question around the Middle East, one thing that I think uh, the labor movement has focused on a lot um, during the Arab Spring and the before and after was the fact that we build long-term relationships so that when the Arab Spring happened, for example, we already had a relationship with the independent workers who had formed the Tax Collectors Union and were already trying to create some space outside of the formal ETUF structure. And we already had those relationships so that we were able to work together. Uh, I like to tell the story when people were protesting in Wisconsin, our brothers and sisters from Cairo sent them a pizza to say to them, and, and we have a wonderful video clip of some of the independent labor leaders saying, if we can do it, get out there in Wisconsin and do it. So um, building long-term um, sustainable relationships, and, and, and you don't ever know when you know, you're gonna need to shift them again, because situations change. We're working with the Bahrainis. Um, we're using a free trade agreement here in the United States to create space around um, attacks on worker rights in Bahrain. So we get very creative, but I think that, you know, the one thing is building these relationships um, globally, because we have to have them, to continue to open space in very difficult places. The United States is a difficult place to form a union, just to say anyone that stands up usually gets automatically fired. So we get just as inspired by Egyptians who take to the streets under incredibly difficult situations. And when they say to us, you can do it, it's, it's an incredible two-way uh, conversation. And I would just end by all these discussions around voice. I, I agree with sort of you know, Renana grounding it, especially for the labor movement, what we mean by voice. And we often mean also a collective voice. And I, I think one of the things that's evolving right now is new forms of leadership. And I think Sewa has always had a, sort of a shared form uh, of leadership and uh, people were asking you know well, how do you support a leader and, and well it's 
for us, it's a vision. You need collective. You need to build a, a collective voice because it's very easy to pick off one person, um, and that's what they will try to do. And in terms, as a trade unionist, we absolutely have a vision that to have real power. Uh, obviously, you'll have fantastic leaders, but you need your group. And you guys had a real strategy around building your group. And here we have a strategy. You have to build a collective voice to build collective worker power. So it's not just the individual standing up, but they've got they turn around and they've got all those workers behind them, um, and that's real power and voice. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we probably didn't cover anything which was in the script at the beginning, but uh, if, for me at least, it was fascinating to, to listen to you. I think we in the bank have a lot to reflect on everything, how we, as Samantha had said, how we work at building voice uh, around schools and providers, um, how, uh, but also how we link that and how we conceptualize uh, at a much broader level uh, how voice for those who don't have it leads to social transformations, which is something we are, we've really only started thinking about in, in our organization. I want to thank you all enormously. I want to invite you to, to, to lunch downstairs. It's a wonderful buffet lunch. But those of you who also come, um, hopefully we'll have one or the other of the panelists with us, and we can continue a little bit the discussion. I do want to thank the Jobs Knowledge Platform, who Twittered and Facebooked and whatever other verbs we can find. Um, through this period, we actually have a couple of Facebook and Twitter questions in. They were very specific, so I, I'll uh, promise to establish the link to one of the panelists so that they can be answered. And also special thanks to Frederica and Dina uh, for, for putting the session together, for bringing the panelists here. Uh, I thought it was extraordinarily rich. I hope you too have a good lunch. <laughs>